All right? So you were giving some advice to Mr. Mandela this morning in the newspaper about African politics and how it needs to evolve. Well, I could, give, I could say two things to him. One is just go to your bedroom and sleep. No. Uh, you know something. Bef it's, it's actually one of these wonderful things. When there are some who can be that way, who get to be very uh, arrogant and uh, you know, speak, what's the matter with you Africans? Uh, can't you get your act together? And then I, I, I say to them, <laughs> you know, the history of Europe gives me great hope for Africa. Because I think, I mean, we actually don't have a, a historical sense. Can you imagine the West pro has produced the one country that used weapons of mass destruction? It's not been done by anybody else. The West. The West has produced the Holocaust. Until recently, two sets of Christians were at each other's throats in Northern Ireland. You had the military dictatorships in Spain, Portugal, and the home of democracy, Greece. So I say, look at you now. I mean, with that kind of antecedent, you, you, should, you should be nothing. But look at you. And, and we really have, have no historical sense. We've forgotten, we've forgotten, <laughs> we've forgotten that when there was a famine in the Holy Land, they came to Africa. They fled to Africa for refuge. When the Holy Family was being persecuted by Herod, they ran to Africa. And some of the greatest scholars of the young church were African, Augustine, Athanasius, and so forth and so on. And so, you know, one has to say human beings are very strange things. Um, yeah, I. For what is it's worth, I've I've uh, I've covered. I mean, a few of our African uh, leaders. Um, at one time, I, I, I was going around many of the African countries. I was president of the All Africa Conference of Churches, and I was saying to them, "You know what? Democracy and freedom are cheaper than oppression. You don't have to have." All of the, for instance, the, the, the huge convoys that they have to be protected. I mean, when you look at somebody like Julius Nyerere, now he may not have done too well uh, economically, but he was fantastic. I mean, the, uh, I, I've not yet met Africans as proud, properly proud, as Tanzanians. But then you see, he was, he was a true democrat. And you can see in, in, in Tanzania how they have been able to change governments without, much, without any bloodshed, really. Uh, so I would, I would say Madiba, just before you expire, 
why don't you just call on, on Africa to be true to themselves? Because you know, the traditional African political system was not one that tolerated tyrants. You had to be a king who, you had to be very good at assessing consensus. That was the good king. So recover the best that is in you. Say so, Madiba. Say so, they will listen to you. So, um, also you talked about the digital divide this morning. The who? The digital divide. You talked about GPSs and Facebook. You see and now, uh, oh, digital divide, yes. I can just about get my emails. Fantastic. Yeah. Facebook? No, no Facebook yet. So, who? Facebook. No, 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 no. I, th some people have said, uh, join us. Jo I say, no, not yet. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but uh, you've urged all these people to be ethical business people. You've urged them to learn from Ubu Untu. So what can people in this room do to further the global cause. You're the chairman of the elders. You have lots of pressing issues around the world you think about. But if you was one thing these people could go tomorrow and do differently, what do you want them to do? You have, oh, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you have a lot of clout. I mean, governments can't do anything without budgets. I wonder if you went and said to, to your presidents, your prime ministers, your chancellors, our survival depends on our recognition that we are family. Can I just... I, I, I mean, I knew I was being interviewed by three, uh, five year old, six, seven year old, and they said, please give short answers. Uh, I'm going to try and make this one short. You, you know, God has been trying from the year dot to say to us, you are family. Yes, you are different. You are different, diverse, not in order to be separated. You are different in order to know that none of you can ever be self-sufficient. You know, you are, you are different because <laughs> God, God, God is actually quite smart. I mean, you know, uh, when you come to think of it, uh, it is... You and I are created in such a way that none of us can ever survive on our own. We are made for complementarity. No, we don't accept that. <laughs> no, no, man, nonsense. Complementarity with those Africans. Yes. Then God says, look, you have only one home, this planet. And we behave as if there are those of us who are going to be able to jump off. You can't jump off. This is the only home we have. Please, God says, look after it. And we say, twaddle, God. And the people who suffer the ill effects of climate change, ah, man, it's those, it's those people over there. I was at a service in, in, in Norway about three years ago. And a woman bishop from Greenland 
came and she said, we can no longer go hunting because the ice is too thin. We can't skate over the ice. And, and the polar bears are dying because they are drowning. Then some, another, a woman came from the South Sea Islands and she said, the sea level is rising. Not tomorrow, now. And so you go and say to your governments, just change the raison d'etre for your existence. Now, you, you might say that that is too low, or, I mean, it's, it's impossible. If it is impossible, then it is curtains for us. Hey? Just bye bye. We're done for. <laughs> and well, I'm, I've, I've seen a fair bit of life, so it's not too bad. I mean, I'll, I'll be 80 next year, uh, and uh, I've seen a few things, so that's all right. But you are, you are young. You. You've still got all of your life ahead of you. Do you want that life to be a hell? Or do you want that life to be exhilarating? <laughs> I can answer the question for you. Do people have questions? We have two mics over there. I think we can take a question or two, please. Be kind enough to introduce yourself, so. They don't, wonder. Oh, oh. Sorry, <laughs> Archbishop Tutu, uh, Rupert Day. Um, you received your honor, a uh, Nobel Peace Prize, after a elephant turn effort. President Obama got his on the possible promise of something. As the world's most powerful man, as you've put him, what is the one thing you think he needs to do so we can all look back and say he actually deserved it? <laughs> Which ear was that? The good ear or the bad ear? <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you what I said to about 300 young people when they asked, uh, what do you, do you have to do to get a Nobel Peace Prize? And I said, oh, oh, very easy. Three things. You must have a large nose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you must have an easy name. Tutu. <laughs> and I was wearing shorts and I said, three, you must have sexy legs. Uh, <laughs> Basically, actually, I was just saying to those young kids, Nobel laureates don't come floating from heaven. There's no reason why there should be none amongst you. I'm not thinking, I mean, I, I know the, the answer is the Middle East. Sort that out. or be on the way to giving people the great hope that you yeah. are. Because without a resolution of the Middle East, you can forget about resolving things relating to <coughs> nuclear armaments and the so-called terrorism. You're playing marbles. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Rupert. Are there any more? Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Archbishop. Thank I you. think we will all will give you the answer. <laughs> Thank you.